Was it a serial killer or someone they knew? Was this dog butchered by the same person who slaughtered the four college students? Who called 911? They first called their friends, not police. Police still need the public's help to find the killer, and they're getting it. Police still have zero suspects. We have heard mention that Kaylee stated she may have had a stalker. Statistically, it's most likely to be someone from that community. Uh, the headline today really is that there isn't one. Moscow police threw people for a loop last night when they said they did not know if four University of Idaho students were victims of a targeted attack. The back and forth leaving both students and local residents confused and worried. The community has patience. Other people don't. I don't like it one bit. Today I want to talk about the Idaho College murders. I know everyone is talking about them. You guys have been sending me requests in the comments and emails. So I decided I'm going to make a video and I want to focus on the facts like the timeline but also the theories, fact checking the theories because there are so many theories in this case. Such a gruesome and strange case but then there are all these unanswered questions even though we do have a decent amount of details but obviously not everything which is how it should be uh, but the, the rumors are creating problems for people and like the speculation some of it is good it's leading to information that is needed but also you know when people start getting harassed or it leads down a trail that is just a distraction for investigators that's not really that great without talking too much I want to do what I usually do on my channel which is I want to give you guys the facts and then we'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself and of course if anyone has any credible information I'll remind you guys of where to send it I'll leave a link below or I'll put it across here uh, but anyway, let's hear from the sponsor, then get to the video. Hi guys, this video is sponsored by Bright Cellars and everything is bright over here too. So. so there are a lot of wine clubs, right? A bunch. Okay, what makes Bright Cellars different? I'm going to tell you. Their packaging is plastic free and completely recyclable. So it is the most sustainable option as well. All you have to do is take a seven question quiz. They curate it to your taste palette. They ask you certain things about how you, what you like to eat and what tastes good to you. And they pick wines based on that. Each box comes with wine education cards for each bottle and they give you tasting notes, suggested food pairings, the best temperature to serve it, where it came from. The cool thing too is you rate the wines that you get. So each box you get is more and more tailored to your taste as they figure out what you like. So it gets better with time, like fine wine. <laughs> this one is called Folk and Fable and it's, it says Private Reserve. This is the wine card that comes with it. It says you can pair it with smoky chipotle cheddar. Mm. And so if you're going and you need a last minute gift, you can just grab one you know, with the wine card and take it to like a dinner party or something like that. They do have a holiday offer. If you're interested, it's basically $50 off your first box plus $20 off the second box. So if you're interested, click the link in the description. And I want to thank Bright Sellers for supporting my channel. And thank you guys for sitting through this. Back to the video. Okay, so to understand this case, you really need to understand the house where the murders happened. Um, so there's six people signed onto the lease at the home. One of those six people, although she's on the lease, she moved out before the start of the school year and wasn't actually living there when this happened. There were five people living there and all five people, including an extra person, a boyfriend of one of these people, were there in the house when the murders occurred. Four of the six people in that home that night were killed. Two survived. They weren't even attacked. So the house is at... Uh, 1122 King Road. It's on a dead end street and it's walking distance from a bunch of frat houses. This is a dense area with lots of homes nearby and is kind of known as a party house. Now all of the victims were members of fraternities or sororities. Like Greek life was a big part of their lives. So now let's talk about the layout of the home. It is three stories. It's 2,300 square feet. It's not a typical layout. So you have the first floor um, is next to the garage. Some people refer to it as the basement. Um, the later levels of the home were, were added on later. So it's kind of where the, the basement is not directly under the second and third floor. Second and fl third floor are where the murders occurred. And the first floor is where the survivors were at. Okay, so keep that in mind. Two of the four victims were found in their beds in the second floor and the other two were found in their beds in the third floor. 
So the victims on the second floor were Ethan and Zana, and they were a couple. The victims on the third floor are Kaylee and Maddie, and they're lifelong best friends. Each pair of victims were in the same bed, sleeping, we think, when, when it happened. We do know that some of the victims had defensive wounds, not all, and we know that one of those people with defensive wounds was Zana. And we also know that there was no SA, if you know what I mean, involved in, with any of the victims. They were all killed the same way, multiple stab wounds, and it appears as though it's with the same weapon. The murder weapon is described as a fixed blade knife. At first, the authorities called it like a Rambo style combat knife, but now they're just saying it's a large fixed blade knife. There was also a dog that was found alive at the scene when police arrived, and it was one of the victim's dogs, Kaylee. Uh, the dog's called Murphy, and she shared this dog with her ex-boyfriend, Jack, um, who's gonna factor into the story a little bit later. So now I wanna go over the latest timeline, and then we'll do the theories. We're gonna start on the 12th of November, which is the night before the murders. We do know that there are some Venmo transactions that were made that day, and I wanna read them to you. It's at 1.59, Ethan sent Kaylee money with the caption, thank you. Then again, at 2.10, he sends her money again with the caption, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at 8.57, there was a post on social media, it was Kaylee. She posted on her Instagram a photo with all the victims and the surviving roommates. And this was her last Instagram post. And the caption, in articles that I found, they describe a caption, but I went to check on it and it doesn't seem like there's a caption there. But according to the articles, it said, one lucky girl to be surrounded by these people every day. Later that night, Saturday night, everyone in that home goes out, but they go out separately. So, the two surviving roommates, they went out of town separately and they came home at 1 a.m., which is, they were the first people home. Then Ethan and Zana, the couple on the second floor, they went to a frat party at Sigma Chi Frat House, house, house which is not far from where they live, like at all, and like walking distance. There's a little bit of confusion about how long they were at that party because according to police, they were last seen there at nine and then there's a gap from nine to 1.45 a.m. where authorities say they don't know where Ethan and Zana were. But according to a YouTuber from Hidden Crime YouTube channel, she says she spoke to the mother of someone who texted Ethan and from that text with Ethan, he says that he thinks Ethan was still at the Sigma Chi frat party at 2 a.m. So I don't really know. They said they reached out to police to try to let them know, but they haven't heard back. So I'm not sure what time uh, they got home, but according to police, they were back at the house at 1.45 a.m. and they don't know what happened between 9 p.m. and 1.45 a.m. Back to the Venmo transactions, we do know that at 11.40 p.m., Ethan made another Venmo transaction, which was his last Venmo transaction. And this one was to someone called Jack. People started looking into Jack and they found something they think is weird, which is that Jack's sister, um, Liz, got a Venmo from someone called Molly. And the caption of that Venmo was 3.30 a.m. And 3.30 a.m. is around the time where authorities think the murder occurred. Uh, or when they think it occurred. So some people are like, oh, that's really weird. I don't know, but I'm just gonna mention that. So according to police, at 1.45 a.m., Ethan and Zana are at the home. It could also be at the party, we don't know. As for Kaylee and Maddie, they went to a bar, okay, it's called The Corner Club at 11 p.m., and they stayed there till 1.30 a.m. 10 minutes later, they're captured on video at a food truck ordering food. I would like the, um... Now there's a guy there that's watching them and seems to say something about them as they go out of frame uh, but we'll talk more about this guy later because he's another part of the story and we'll talk about him later. So they end up taking like a designated driver service that the college offers uh, to go home and according to the neighbors surveillance footage they get to the house at 1.56 a.m. So pretty much by 2 a.m., uh, if, if we're going by what police say, everyone is at the home. Then, 
between 2.26 a.m. and 2.52 a.m., Kaylee makes seven missed calls uh, to Jack, her ex-boyfriend. Not the Jack from the Venmo with Ethan, her ex-boyfriend Jack, who shares the dog with her. She calls him seven times. He doesn't answer. And then Maddie's phone calls him, I think, three more times. He also doesn't answer. So Jack is Kaylee's ex-boyfriend. Apparently, they broke up amicably. Um, they're kind of on and off, like they weren't on bad terms. And... He also goes to the University of Idaho, which I don't know if I mentioned that. This happened at the University of Idaho. Duh. According to Jack, he said he didn't answer those calls because he was sleeping. So we really don't know what happens from then on, like from 3 a.m. ish till when the cops 911 were called, which was around 12 in the afternoon. We don't know what happened, but the murders happened during this time. Police suspect that someone came into the home they think between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. and basically stabbed four out of the six people in that house uh, with that Rambo-style knife that they now say is just a fixed blade knife. The coroner, oddly enough, has been doing interviews, which some people think is weird, but that's a different thing. But the coroner said uh, she believes the attack was personal. There was blood everywhere, like even seeping out of the walls of the outside of the house, just everywhere. It's just very gruesome, horrific crime. Now, the knife has not been recovered, and there are no suspects. Police suspect that the victims were probably asleep when the attacks occurred, but at some point, some of them woke up because they had defensive wounds. As for the suspects, like, is it one person? Is it more than one person? That's another thing we don't know. If they were sleeping, you know, one person could have done it, but also, you know, one person, four people. It could have been more than one person. The wounds are all stab wounds, um, multiple stab wounds, and it seems like it's from the same knife, but it could be two people with the same knife, if you know what I mean. As for the two surviving roommates, okay, they were on the first floor. Remember how I told you the first floor is not directly underneath the second and third. So they claimed that they basically slept through the whole attack and that their doors were locked. And the reason why they locked the doors, remember I told you it was a party house. And so sometimes people would barge in on them. And so they made a point to lock the doors and ask for noises that could have been happening. Um, if there's a party going on, they might not have thought much of it. The second and third floors where the murders occurred, they have sliding doors leading into them. And there's also a back door on the first floor. Uh, so these are entry points where someone could have come in. So like I said, we don't know what happened after around 3 a.m., but we do know that at 11.58 a.m., someone called 911 from one of the surviving roommates' cell phones. But we don't know who actually made that call because before that call was made, the two surviving roommates, they invited or called their friends over because they felt like one of the people they were contacting, we think it's Santa, was unresponsive. She wasn't responding to phone calls or texts. They were trying to reach them. And so they thought they, they were unconscious. And so they end up calling friends to come over first before calling 911. By 11.58 a.m., that's when they called 911 and they reported an unconscious person. They didn't report a stabbing or anything. So we don't really know like what all they saw, why they said that. They just called... 911 and whoever called them ended up passing the phone around and it was multiple people who ended up speaking to the 911 dispatcher at that time. Then when cops arrived, they saw that there were four people that were stabbed to death in their beds. There was no damage to the property, no sign of forced entry. Now, I don't know, and I really wish we did know, uh, if the sliding doors were locked or unlocked or the back door was locked or unlocked. So could it have been like, a random person opening it or was it where they locked and so whoever was doing this had to be let in you know this is where like the confusion came in because the prosecutor the mayor the police they were all kind of saying different things the mayor came out and said this was a crime of passion or maybe a burglary the prosecutor said this was undoubtedly a targeted attack the police said um this is a targeted attack at first but then they walked it back and then now recently when I was checking for updates um, they're saying it's a targeted attack again but the confusion is that authorities are saying we know it's targeted we just don't know if the target was 
one or more of the people or if the target was just the house. So there was all this confusion going on and they wanted to appeal to the public for help. So the police end up releasing this aerial map with uh, plots of like the timeline of the victim's last movements. And they were asking for help from the community, like surveillance footage, any information that they know. And they also came out and said they still don't have a suspect and they don't even know the motive behind the attack. But the public, they had ideas of suspects and motives. They suspected the man in the white hoodie in the footage. Remember I told you that food truck footage. They also suspected maybe the driver who drove them home. And then they also suspected the two roommates who survived the attack. They also suspected Kaylee's ex-boyfriend, Jack, who they called multiple times. The police end up coming out and clearing all of these people. We do not believe the following individuals were involved. The two surviving roommates, the male seen in a grub truck video uh, circulating on the internet, a private party who drove Kaylee and Madison home, any of the individuals who spoke to the dispatcher on the 911 call. They also said, by the way, it's not a murder-suicide situation, like it's not one of the victims who did it, um, it's someone else, we don't know who it is. Then it came out that Kaylee told people that she had a stalker. Police then come out and they say, we've looked, we've done all these searches and we cannot prove or verify the existence of a stalker, but we're not saying for sure there's no stalker. And they asked the public for help with that, but they kind of were like, we don't have proof that she has a stalker. Then another person that people suspected was uh, the quote, socially awkward neighbor. I didn't do it. I have nothing to hide. I'm willing to give DNA, fingerprints, whatever they need. It's just upsetting being compared to a murderer when I didn't do anything. So those are basically the facts, like what came out, what police said. Now let's talk about the theories. The first theory is, uh, is more not so much a theory as it was a rumor that turned out to be false, which is that the victims were bound and gagged. And this shows you how things can spread on the internet, completely false rumors. It was going on for a while where people thought that and police had to come out and say, actually, no, that's not true at all. So that's just one thing I want to get out of the way. The other theory is that people are saying this is connected to a crime that happened in Oregon. And there are a lot of similarities with this crime. First of all, this happened on August 13th, so a little over a year ago. It happened on the 13th, um, and this crime happened on the 13th. And what basically happened in Oregon is someone came in, stabbed a couple multiple times, and it was on the 13th at 3 a.m., same as what people are theorizing happened in Idaho. And that person is was never caught. So whoever did it, is at large. So people are starting thinking, starting to think, could this be the same person? And the way they're theorizing it is maybe this person targets couples and the targets were Ethan and Zana and maybe Kaylee and Maddie were collateral damage or maybe they decided to go for them anyway. Maybe they didn't know that there were two more on the first floor or they couldn't enter because the door was locked. And so that's the connection they're making. But again, police came out and said, no, this is not connected. They did acknowledge that there were similarities, but they said that they have found nothing to connect the two crimes. I don't know, you make of it what you want, but that's definitely a theory that I've seen going around. The other thing that it's a lot of these are similar where it's like a theory and then the police ruled it out, but some people are like, okay, then it's not. And then a lot of other people are like, no, they're messing up, they're dropping the ball, blah, blah, blah. So again, you decide, I just wanna give you like the facts. So there was the issue of the skinned dog that was found three miles away before these murders happened. Ugh. So this one, uh, there was a couple, they lived nearby. They said their dog was skinned. I think the word filleted was also used, butchered, killed. It was a gruesome, horrible thing. And it, it didn't happen too far away from where this happened. And there was also talk that there were dead animals found on the, in the home, around, sorry, the home where the murders happened. So is this like some serial killer shit where, where they're practicing on animals and then they go to the humans? Is this connected? Is the person who killed the dog the same person who killed them? And the weird thing is to remember there was a dog in the home, Murphy, and that dog was unharmed. And then that's a whole other thing we'll talk about later about why the dog may have not been harmed. Uh, but basically, 
Police came out and denied that too. They said that there were dead animals, that is true, around the property of the home, but they uh, said that that was due to wildlife activity. So <clears throat> animals killing other animals, they don't feel like it was connected to the crime. So go going to the, like, the dog that was in the home, Murphy, that was spared, like, why did this person spare the dog's life? Do they just like hate humans and like dogs? Or some people are speculating that that person knew the dog. Now we know that that dog was owned by Kaylee and her ex-boyfriend Jack. So some people are saying, what if it was Jack and the, he didn't hurt the dog because that's his dog and the dog actually is now with him. Uh, or if it wasn't Jack, uh, maybe it was someone that the dog knew. Like that's the next question, right? Was the dog barking? Would the dog bark if it was someone they knew or didn't know? And did people hear that there were dogs barking at that time or a dog barking? So speaking of the dog and Jack, that brings me to the Jack theory. Let's talk about it because that one, the family is totally against like Kaylee's family. They support him a hundred percent. And Jack is with us and, and we stand behind him 100%. The thing is police have cleared him. So it's messed up for people to harass him and do stuff like that. If the police have cleared him and we just don't know just because you think he did it doesn't mean he did it. And, and, and I can understand some of the things that make him look suspicious, but the family supports him. The police have cleared him. And, you know, I don't know what else. The thing about it is if they called him and he was in danger, they were in danger uh, why wouldn't they call 911? Because that's something people are saying, like maybe they were calling him because they were in danger. Regarding why Kaylee may have called him so many times, according to her sister, that's just what she did late at night, okay? They were all drinking. She, they said that she was the type that would call repeatedly until someone answered, even if it was late at night, and it wouldn't even be like an emergency or anything. Like she even said she would call like that just to end up asking like, what should I eat right now? You know, so it's like a drunk, drunken phone call kind of thing. That's just what she did. And Jack says he didn't answer because he was sleeping. And it could just be that's it. The more concerning thing I would say is the fact that she said, Kaylee, that she had a stalker. And so let's talk about the stalker theory because police, they didn't say they found proof, but they also couldn't rule it out. And it was several people who she told. Her father says he thinks she had a stalker. Uh, there was some ex-prosecutor like from the OJ trial who said he got reliable information of someone who said she told them she had a stalker. I talked to one student. It was twice removed from the person that said it, Kaylee. But Kaylee, two months ago, complained about a stalker. So it's like, if she said she had a stalker and she ended up dead, it's not that big of a stretch. Like, what if that person was looking for Kaylee, went to the second floor? Because, you know, Zana was in that second floor. She had defensive wounds. Maybe she woke up and saw him. And so he felt he had to stab her to get rid of a witness and the same thing with Ethan. Then they go up to the third floor and Kaylee and Maddie are in the same bed. He's trying to stab Kaylee. He's going to have to stab Maddie too. Like maybe he was going for Kaylee and all the rest were collateral damage. Wrong place, wrong time. He had to get rid of the witnesses. That seems kind of plausible to me. So then it's like, again, people are like, well, what about the two roommates that survived? You know, which list that brings me to that theory. Let's talk about the two roommates. So, they said they locked the door for a reason that makes total sense, which is they didn't want people barging in when they were partying. And like I said, they were all drinking and sleeping. They could have been like sleeping heavy from drinking. And on top of that, again, police talked to them and cleared them and their victims too. And it seems like everyone, the family, the victims' families, everyone is supporting them. Like they went through a traumatic incident too. And so the thing that people bring up as well though is like, What's with that gap of time where they didn't call police? What's with the fact that they called their friends over first before calling police? Why when they finally do call 911, they say the person is unconscious? They don't say they've been stabbed multiple times. Well, how far did they go into the crime scene? What did they see? We don't know any of that. The police probably do, and they've cleared them as suspects. So I don't know. Could it be that they were asleep if they got there at 1 a.m.? They could have slept didn't, instead of going to the rooms, they probably just texted and called to see them. If they didn't answer, they thought, oh, maybe they drank too much and they're unconscious. Maybe they panicked, like, oh no, they binge drank and they, like, let's call our friends instead of getting in trouble. And then when they realized that, 
she could be serious. Like maybe they didn't see the extent of the injuries and then they called 911. Because when, whoever called 911 called from their phone. They said an unconscious person. And then they end up, the dispatcher talks to the roommates and the friends like they're passing the phone around. And soon after, police show up and they see the gruesome scene. Some people are saying, how could you have not known it was a stabbing when it's being described how gruesome the scene was, blood seeping from outside the walls and everywhere. Like, how could they have not known? I don't know, maybe maybe there's more to the story of what they actually told police or the 911 dispatcher. All we know is that they said an unconscious person, but who knows what was said later and when they found out that it was actually a stabbing. You know, that's the thing, right? Police aren't giving a lot of information and when there's this absence of information, there's all the speculation that comes in and they're speculating based on limited information. So it's like, it can go, wrong really quickly and that's kind of what's happening with this case which is why I wanted to make this video. Who could it be right now this is when that incel theory comes into play. There's growing suspicion that the killer of the four University of Idaho students might be an incel. The killer may have been rejected by one of the slain women. Incels are very very dangerous. You know those like ex-FBI profilers that they bring on these news shows to, to basically speculate about what they think happened and their profiling experience is telling them they feel like it's it's an incel thing where it's like a younger male who maybe was rejected by like these pretty sorority girls and was mad about it and was going to get revenge. Like remember that um, when I did the incel video, Elliot Roger, like he was really mad that he couldn't have a girlfriend. It's like killed a bunch of people. Like, could this be that? Adding fuel to this fire is the fact that after the killings, there are a bunch of 911 calls reporting suspicious behavior by males that would maybe fit the incel theory or even the stalker theory if the stalker was a male. Police never mentioned the gender of the attacker. Everyone is assuming it's a male, but really we don't know for sure. If they were sleeping, they could be overpowered easily. It doesn't have to be multiple people, a strong person. If that person comes into a room where someone is sleeping and starts stabbing really quickly, um, those people wouldn't have much resistance to face. So I want to read you some of the like reports from the 911 calls because the police, they release 911 calls in that area like periodically and people are going through them and that's where they're getting this from. A person called 911 and said that on Thanksgiving Day, a man gave their daughter a note written on a receipt when she was at work saying, quote, you better watch out. Someone else called to report a man walking and tearing down the posters with tip line information about the murders. Uh, there's another call about someone who was being suspicious like with a ski mask taking pictures of like the upper floors of homes. Whether this was an insult or a stalker uh, we don't know or an incel stalker it could be both uh, but it seems like whoever it was was able to get into the home easy. Whether they knew of the home, whether they were casing it and, and noticed that they, it was easily accessible. Maybe they noticed that the doors wouldn't get locked or it was a party house. Could have been someone that went to the party and knew about the home. Or it could be someone that they knew well enough to let into the home and then they attacked them. Because remember, there's no signs of forced entry. So um, again, I would really love to know if those doors were locked, if the sliding door or the back door were locked, because that would really tell you whether they were let into the home by someone. And if they were let into the home by someone, they probably definitely knew them. Or if it was unlocked, then that could open the possibility of like a random person they didn't know. Which brings me to the whole targeted or random. That was such a source of confusion. Like, is this like a random, the serial killer, and they're connecting it to all the other crimes with the stabbings at 3 a.m. on the 13th? Or is this targeted in the sense that they're targeting someone there and it's, it's a, specific crime against a specific person or when the cops say that option of they're targeting the home like what do they mean targeting the home like they just knew that this was a vulnerable home you know and they just wanted to kill and so they picked that home is that what that means i don't know because it was like at first they say the police came out and said there's no threat to the community at large, even though the suspect is at large, sorry. So if there's no threat to the community was their first instinct, maybe they felt like a person was targeted, that killer only wanted to hurt that person and they're not gonna do it again. But it's weird to say that when someone just gruesomely, like brutally killed 
four people and they don't even have the suspect and they're telling the community, you're fine. So obviously people were upset about that. They end up walking that back to, the police have had to walk back several comments they made. But they did walk that back and they said, there is a threat to the community. Please remain vigilant, um, obviously. And it's so crazy because it's like everyone feels like the killer could be right under their noses. If this is someone they knew, right? Someone part of this community, they could be right there acting normal with everyone. Even Kaylee's dad said he didn't have a funeral for her because his wife was terrified that the murderer would attend the funeral. You know, it's like that is the part. It adds another like really creepy layer to it is like, who is this person? Did this person run away? Is this person right there among them? So this is why a lot of people are still suspecting the people that the police cleared, okay? We don't know what they know though. We don't know how they've cleared them, what they did. So it really comes down to whether people trust the police and there's a lot of people that don't. So when they see it a certain way and, and they're like, the police aren't seeing it that way, they're, they're quick to dismiss them because they're not perfect and they have walked things back. Like they messed up the timeline a few things. They said that they, um, at first they said an Uber dropped them off. It wasn't an Uber, uh, Kaylee and Maddie. Then they, they, they said Kaylee and Maddie got home at 1.45, but then later on they said it was at 1.56, which isn't a huge thing. But remember there's that thing with Ethan and where he was at 2 a.m. According to police, he is, already at the home, according to this person whose son texted him, he was at the party and they tried to call police to give them a, a tip uh, that they, they have a text of someone who spoke to Ethan the night of the murders and they said they haven't gotten a call back. Now, they have probably are getting so many tips because this, this case is huge, which is why Really, if you're going to make a credible tip, not just, oh, I heard something, whatever, because it wastes the resources, it wastes precious time. And so people like that who have direct communication, a text message with the victim the night of the murder, that's important. Um, so maybe they're just over overloaded, although they did bring in so many agencies, the FBI is involved, but there's just so much to go through. So who knows? The white hoodie guy, let's talk about him because a lot of people talk about two things. The fact that he that hand motion seemed like he was upset about something, but then they also talk about the audio, like certain people in Reddit are saying that they hear a woman's voice say F you. So there is a witness though. There's a witness called Joe who saw the interaction between the white hoodie guy and Maddie and Kaylee, and I want to read you what he said. Quote, it says, his impression was that the man was there to make sure that they got home safe because they appeared, quote, super drunk. He admitted that he didn't know the man personally, saying, quote, I thought he was a solid guy. Believe me when I tell you that his vibe was not bad. He said, after that, a car pulled up and a man called out to the women, leading them to ditch the man. So white hoodie guy was supposed to give them the ride. They end up going with that other designated driver ride, and this guy, Joe, who witnessed it said, I said, bro, they're leaving. He said, what the F? And then I said, sorry, brother. So he wants to get them home safe, but he seems upset that they didn't leave with him. And this is making people be like, oh, what if he got mad and decided to like, go get the, the, the knife and go over there and stab them. But again, he's been cleared by police. So I don't know. So another person that people suspected was uh, the killer is that socially awkward neighbor I was telling you about. And this guy has been harassed, harassed um, to the point where he's like gone on all these um, interviews trying to say like, I, I'll give DNA, I'll do lie detector, whatever you need me to do. He's got a gun um, because he did some interviews in the beginning and people thought it was weird. The last murder here was 2015, so seven years ago sort of rare, doesn't happen often, so people aren't used to it. <laughs> Let me read you the quotes. He said, I didn't do it. I have nothing to hide. I'm willing to give DNA, fingerprints, whatever they need. He said, I'm naturally an awkward person. Just my mannerisms, the way I talk, my natural person is just, I'm a little bit socially awkward, so I might smile at points that I shouldn't. I might make weird hand movements when I shouldn't. He said that officers did come to his home. They didn't take DNA, but they asked him questions. So these, these internet sleuths that 
think he's a suspect. One of them left a comment and says, why is Jeremy Reagan wearing a black bandage on his left hand? I'm not accusing him, but that's just strange. He also doesn't blink when he says, no, I went to bed. Just strange. He says that at the night of the murders, he was at home sleeping. He says he knows that the home is a party home when he walks his dog. It's like there's always parties going on. And he says he only went like to the home once, but he just like, there was a phone that he, he found on the ground. He was trying to see whose phone it was. He knocked on the door. A girl answered. He asked her, is this your phone or anyone's home phone? She said, no, he left. So most people are suspecting that it's one person, but could it be more than one killer? Could it be two people? Remember, this is what we're talking about. Does it have to be a male? Could it be a female? So let's talk about that, right? The, the murder weapon, it seems like they all were stabbed by the same weapon. All their stab wounds are the same. Could it be two people with the same type of knife? Or is it one person with one knife? Could it be a female could stab all four of them? Well, if they're sleeping and, and they come unaware and they start stabbing, maybe. Same thing with one man. Like, really, it could go both ways. So that's still unclear. But most people are leaning towards, like, a lone wolf person who did this um, for whatever reason. And that's the thing, right? There's no motive. That's another thing trying to figure out. What is the motive of this? Is this random serial killer shit or is this like revenge? Finally, I want to talk about like who the targets could be. Was it all four of them or is it like one or two people and then the rest were collateral damage? Because if they were just trying to kill to kill, would they have really tried to go, go into the first floor bedroom or maybe they didn't know there was a first floor maybe they came in through a sliding door if you can look at the home picture you'll see if they came in through the sliding door the way the house is set up they could have just gone there or were they targeting someone could it Ethan and Zana been the target and then Kaylee and see but Kaylee and Maddie were in the bed so they would have had to go up there and and go to them in the bed so and they probably came in through the second floor more than likely they could have come in through the third floor first but if they did come in through the sliding door or through the door it would it would be going through the second first so it's like were Kaylee and Maddie the targets a lot of people think that maybe Kaylee and Maddie were the targets because they kept going after Ethan or maybe all four of them were the targets maybe they wanted to get to the the other two but the door was locked and maybe the other rooms the door was unlocked maybe they didn't know that someone was in there in the basement they didn't know the sleeping arrangements. They just knew of the house. So many questions. So many questions. So, um, I don't know if this video was any help or any useful, but I wanted to do it. I felt like that's what I could contribute because that's usually what I do on my channel is like facts and the theories and try to rationalize and not just speculate for the sake of speculation. But anyway, hopefully this video was useful in some way. Uh, but thank you guys for watching. Uh, thank you to Bright Sellers for sponsoring the video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.